Right. Well, Cable Green, it's a, a pleasure to welcome you to Penn State. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so as you know, we do these uh, COIL perspective questions, and our opportunity is when we have uh, leading thinkers in, we like to sort of poke around on some questions about higher education. So I have three for you this morning. Great. The first one is um, having you maybe share with us your vision of a three to five years out in higher education. What might it look like? And as we were talking earlier, there are lots of forces and dynamics going around. Um, three to five years is not real long out, but it's enough. Do you think we'll see some changes in that time period? Second question uh, will have to do with what do you think some of the barriers are that we might have to overcome to get there? The third question has to do about leadership. So let's start with the first one, if you don't mind. Um, where do you see higher ed in, in three to five years? So a lot of things are changing in higher ed right now. Um, let me throw out a few, and then maybe we can focus on one or two okay. of them. So uh, one of them is, uh, is access. Uh, as we all know, the costs of higher education uh, continue to go up. Tuition continues to rise across the board. Uh, the cost of instructional materials uh, continue to go up. Uh, and this is happening in a time in the United States when uh, it's, it's uh, been harder to get jobs, although the economy is coming back. The real challenge for uh, families affording uh, to send their children to college is that the home equity in their, their homes uh, was, uh, has been decimated since 2008, and that's taking a while to come back. So the, what we traditionally have done is take out second mortgages on homes or take out home equity loans, and for many families, that's not there. You couple that with increased tuition with uh, reduced uh, space in some institutions, and that's a real access challenge. So I think that's one of the big uh, challenges that we face. Now, the good news is there are, uh, there are more solutions today than we've ever had before. And so in the next three to five years on this point, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that online learning and hybrid learning uh, have become part of the standard of what we do in, in higher education. And, uh, we'll, we do some face-to-face, -face, we do some online. So that's one important thing. Another part of, of access, of course, is cost. Mm -hmm. So uh, last year, student debt passed $1 trillion in the United States. That's more than all the consumer uh, credit card debt in the whole country. Uh, the average debt that students are leaving Penn State with is right around $26,000, uh, That's a challenge. That's a problem for students. Uh, student debt can't be discharged in bankruptcy court, unlike other kinds of debt, so you're, you're saddled with it. This is slowing down people's ability to start lives, start families, buy a house, buy a car, whatever it is that they want to do to, to get moving in their life. Uh, one of the ways that we're dealing with that uh, in, uh, in the open space is with open educational resources, open textbooks, open curriculum, uh, so that we can significantly reduce those costs. At, at Penn State, the costs of textbooks are roughly 25% of the cost of getting a college degree here. So you know the questions we need to be asking are, what if we took 25% of the cost out? In community colleges, it's closer to half. Um, and in some cases, wow. textbooks cost more than the class itself. Wow. So you know, one of the, in three to five years, what we need to be doing is looking at what are those uh, kind of commodity areas like uh, you know, a basic calculus textbook that instead of spending $200 for students, we can spend zero and have, have better quality. Now, the second area, and then I'll, I'll, maybe we can move on, is, uh, is, is data. So we were talking this morning at breakfast about, uh, about data, student interaction data, um, data about how well a particular piece of content is working to reach uh, student goals. Uh, we talked about data uh, in personalized learning pathways so that students can move at different paces and complete mm -hmm. courses as they're ready. Um, that is, uh, like, like most things, higher education is behind in our use of technology and data as compared to other industries. Uh, but this is an area where we need to be paying attention. There's privacy issues with the students. There's questions about who owns the data. Uh, many people are talking about students should own the data that's generated on them. They should understand how that data is being used. They should give permission for that. Uh, at the same time, Penn State and other institutions need to leverage that data to provide better student services to guide students uh, so they can get to degree quicker and at a lower cost. Uh, and there are just uh, opportunities with data that we've never before had because we didn't have the data, we weren't collecting it. Uh, it's now easier to move the data around and provide nice dashboards to students and faculty about what's working and what's not. Um, along with this is uh, an opportunity for 
uh, students and faculty to have more agency in the data and the content than they have before. But I'll hold on that for mm, what the future might look like. So, so your, your picture of three to five years out might include more access to open educational resources, uh, which might drive down cost, we, we, we hope, and, um, and perhaps um, enabling students to have more control of their information, but also the positives of that information is that maybe we have better learning systems that it helps improve the experience for the learner as well. So that's that's kind of exciting. Um, what are what are the thing the barriers though that we have to overcome to get there? So the biggest barriers, honestly, are uh, are inertia and status quo. So it's easy to say, well, this is the way we've always done it uh, for textbooks. The faculty have always selected a book. Uh, the publishers have come in and sold them on a particular one or the other. And, uh, and the, the faculty, while they choose the book and assign the book, they don't have to pay for the books. And so there's this broken market space around uh, textbooks. Um, what's probably more important, though, in terms of uh, barriers is that we've got a, we still fundamentally use the same core pedagogical experience in the classroom that we've used for 100 or 200 years. Yeah. Uh, and and I'll, I'll oversimplify to make the point, but uh, students enter a class, uh, we, you know, they, uh, yes, there is interactivity and collaboration and engagement, but for the most part, it's the student learning what the faculty member has put together for them to learn. The opportunity in the, the future is, and when, when I said students and faculty have more agency, what I mean by that is with open educational resources, open textbooks, open curriculum, the assignment to the students now can be, here is this course that I, the faculty, have put together. It's as good as I can make it at this point in time. It's in its 20th iteration. I think it's really good, but it can always be better because our field is always changing. And rather than give the students a throwaway assignment where I, I assign them something, they turn it in, I, they read it, I read it, I give them a grade, and then we both throw it away, mm -hmm. never to be seen again. Instead, the opportunity is for faculty to give students assignments that are authentic and meaningful. Mm -hmm. So uh, your assignment is to fix chapter two mm -hmm. because we're learning about political science and uh, it, uh, the Ukraine has since changed yeah. since yeah, the yeah. chapter two was written mm -hmm. last time, right? Or uh, there's a new discovery that just came out of CERN mm -hmm. for particle physics and how we understood dark matter a year ago is, is no longer accurate. Mm -hmm. We have more information. And so your assignment as a student is actually to rewrite that part of the curriculum. Uh, we've kind of never thought about that before. Mm -hmm. because, but we can today and we should because the content's digital, it's easy to modify things. Um, uh, more and more content has a Creative Commons open license on it, so you have the legal rights to make changes. And if you think about that from a student's perspective, I'm much more vested in that experience, sure. right? It's exciting, I, I'm doing something meaningful. And then also, you know, we're preparing people for jobs and to go out into the workplace. And if you're an employer and I, the student, can come to you and say, I didn't just get a degree from Penn State, but my degree from Penn State, I was, I was building stuff. I improved the math curriculum. Right. Uh, I rebuilt parts of my field and pushed it forward. That's a much more meaningful experience. Barriers to that is we haven't done that before. Yeah, right? yeah. So we have to think in new ways. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of engaging the student in the process and contributing to the improvement of that. We can say it's incremental, but, but important instead of waiting five years or 10 years to change the course, it's, it's happening on an ongoing basis. And not just the students, right? This is for faculty too. So mm. too often our model with the content we use in the classroom is what the publishers have built for us right. and that we've consumed as faculty and then we then pass those high costs mm -hmm. on to our students. And the content is being driven by somebody else. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's be honest. The academy are the creators of content. It is your faculty. And it's everybody else's faculty. So if, if there's, a sh there's this shift that not just needs to happen with students mm -hmm. in helping to improve content and own that experience, but, but faculty need do the same thing as yeah. well. And, and that's an exciting thing. It's that is a, very exciting. It's very yeah. exciting to be a faculty yeah. member who is part of creating and recreating what the field looks like and collectively having this need with other colleagues of mine around the world right. and openly licensing everything we build yeah. and sharing it. Yeah, I love that. Um, so, so this is a different space for us if, if we're looking at this three to five year and maybe this will take a bit longer, but um, what, what kind of leadership skills do today's online leaders, you, you met with our VP uh, this morning, Craig Weideman, um, 
you know, as, as people come in to that kind of a role in the next three, five years, what, exp what kind of characteristics do they need to have in order to function in this rapidly changing kind of an environment? So I think the most important leadership skill is the ability to vision a different future given the tools of the day. And the first step in that is to understand the tools of the day. So uh, I mean, today, if you're in education, you have to understand uh, the affordances of digital things. Uh, people who are in leadership positions tend to be uh, older, just as a, they, they just are. <laughs> uh, and uh, that means that the internet did not exist when they were in college. It means that there was no digital content when they were uh, being educated. It means that they were, so, so they, their understanding of how content's created, what the distribution models look like, is radically different than the tools we have today. Today we know with digital things we can store, distribute, make copies of them for near zero cost. That didn't exist 15 years ago. We have open licensing where copyright holders can share with the whole planet without any lawyers being involved legally and still keep their intellectual property. That didn't exist 15 years ago. We've got this crazy thing called the internet where we can move things around at the speed of light. That didn't exist either. And so it, that, that first you have to teach people that. Mm -hmm. and, and, when I, and we need to teach our leaders, we need to teach uh, mm -hmm. faculty, mm -hmm. deans, presidents, provosts, uh, and others, but also uh, policymakers, legislators, mm -hmm. and others that are giving us money, that this new set of tools exist. And with that set of tools, what might the vision be? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So then, then we need to say, well, wow, we could actually, um, here at Penn State, be a leader in thinking about how uh, student data is protected, how students can own their own data, and what uh, we could do with that data to help students get through in four years rather than six. Yeah. Right? And um, we've never been able to have those conversations because these tools are relatively new. So I'd say the leadership quality there is to be able to, uh, to listen, pay attention, and learn to what the new tools are, and then vision something that's really radically different and to uh, hold existing business models in abeyance, if you will, um, and not, not be subject to them in your decision making. And that's hard to do. So, for example, when I was in Washington State in the community colleges, we built the whole general education curriculum as open educational resources. The existing thinking said, well, how, it was a great project, right. but how are you going to sustain that? Right. How are you going to keep paying for it? And we said, hold on a second. Yeah. Uh, if we're not in the business of being educators and developing and keeping up to date our general education curriculum, then what are we in the business to yeah, do? Right, right. Uh, and not only that, but we can, uh, it, not only is it our job to have state-of-the-art curriculum, but it's less expensive than it ever has been, and we can share it with everybody else on the planet. Sure. And because we can do that at the marginal cost of zero, everybody else can help us keep it updated as well. Sure. That's a different way of thinking. Yeah. It's a different way of thinking about collaboration, about yeah. sustainability. So mm. sort of paying attention to what's possible and then making that the new reality is the vision part. How do you get mm. people to move there? And the other part of that is how do you invest for the future? So. Mm. How do you get enough money so that you can provide faculty the time to make those changes? Because yeah. faculty, their, their scarcest resource is time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you provide the right incentives? How do you provide the right uh, recognition so that you're uh, highlighting the folks that are taking these big steps and taking the risk uh, and, and providing them with uh, rewards that are meaningful to yeah. them? And that sometimes might mean changing promotion and tenure policies. So there's all sorts of uh, levers that can be pulled around uh, how we think about supporting people. Um, and the, it's the leaders that need to do that. Okay. So the, you know, the one point you made that was, it just resonates with me is the idea of setting aside for the moment the concern about the business model and, and allowing yourself to first understand the domain and the potential and then come back and say, OK, how, how does this impact us? Um, so, so I think the, the uh, leader today, from what you're describing, needs to be sort of immersed, inversed in the technologies, understand those, uh, have, and then use that to build the, the vision of, of what it might look like, and then think about, okay, how does the business component fit into that? Uh, that, that sounds pretty challenging. Is that any different than a leader 10 years ago, would you say? Or, like, I'm wondering, what's different? What has sure. changed in this environment? 
I, I think what's different today than 10 years ago is the barriers to entry are lower today mm -hmm. for almost every business on the planet. So at breakfast, we were talking about uh, Uber taxis, right? right? So uh, 10 years ago, if you wanted to be a taxi service, say in New York City, you had to go buy a medallion to stick on your cab, and there's only so many of those, and there's all these rules about who can be a taxi driver. Right. Well, today, uh, everybody has a smartphone, and anybody who wants to be a taxi driver can. I mean, you and I could sign up this afternoon right. to be an Uber driver, and we're taxi drivers. Yeah. And uh, so the barrier to entry to becoming a taxi yeah. driver is, is literally five minutes in a cell phone. Yeah. That's different. The barrier to entries mm. in education are still the accredited degree, Right. And having the, the, the expertise and the library and the faculty mm -hmm. around providing a degree that can be accredited. But even those barriers to entry are being challenged. So mm -hmm. we're seeing MOOCs, we're seeing badges as a, as a different way to signal to employers and to professional networks about what your skills and capabilities mm -hmm. might be. We're seeing competency-based learning challenging the idea of seat time. Mm -hmm. We're seeing online and hybrid learning, as we have for 20 years, challenging the idea that you have to be face-to-face -to, -face to learn. Mm -hmm. And so somebody with a different idea about what it means to be an educated person and have those skills assessed so that somebody will give you a job or somebody will recognize your abilities is no longer only what the traditional university right. has provided. Right. Now, as we were talking at breakfast, it's still mostly is the coin of the realm, right. the accredited degree. Right. But I think that's being challenged. Mm -hmm. and, and those challenges from new thinkers, new visionaries, new technologies are coming at higher education in a time of increased costs, right. reduced access. Call for accountability, yeah. Exactly, yeah. right? And the, uh, you know, in a, the, we're seeing um, you know, a shrinking middle class in the mm -hmm. United States and the ability for that shrinking middle class to send their children mm -hmm. to college is becoming more and more difficult. And so something's going to give. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you know, the, the traditional university can try to put up walls and barriers and defend what they've always done, and that is one strategy. A different strategy is to say, we're going to embrace those new tools and lead that change. Uh, and different universities will make different decisions. I think the, the best leaders will be the ones that acknowledge those new sets of tools mm -hmm. and lead and show a not only a more efficient, cost-effective, higher access, lower debt, less time to degree path, which are all important, mm -hmm. but also, and, and I would, if, so I used to be faculty, even more important is a better educational experience where we're developing, uh, you know, uh, so you yeah, George Siemens here talking about constructivism, mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, people who are actually building things in their learning spaces. So when they leave Penn State, they're creators. Yeah. They're yeah. not just recipients of knowledge. Interesting. Wow, great stuff. Well, thank you so much. It's My been pleasure. a pleasure, and uh, welcome to Penn State. Thank you very thank much. Thank you.